So hi, everybody. Thank you for coming for my talk. My name is Edith Levine, and I'm from EMC, Dell EMC, EMC Dell, Dell EMC. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Unikernel. What is it? Why we should use it? Um, and then we kind of like nicely tied it to Kubernetes and explain what, what's the benefit of playing with the two together. So let's start with understand what is Unikernel. So usually when you're running your application today, specifically if you're running in the cloud, for instance on AWS, what's happening is that you have this big stack that you're running your application on top of it. The first thing that you have is the hardware, AWS, somewhere behind the scene, there is hardware. They have an hypervisor, Zen in that use case. Um, and then on top of it, you're putting your VM instance, which is basically an operating system. And in this operating system, you have the virtual drivers, you have the OS kernel, you have the, U the OS user processes, right, that's separate between your processes. Then you have the Docker runtime, we're kind of doing the same, but it's a great packaging tool. And then you're putting inside the Docker container the shell libraries, the language runtime, the application, and the application config. All of this, this is all huge stuff that you're running every time that you're trying to run your microservices application. And when I looked at it, I wonder what actually we're trying to do, why we need all this big stack. And surprise, surprise, our, our aim is kind of like very simple. We try to run a single application with a single user on a single server. That's all we try to do. And there's quite a lot of, of, of redundancy in this stack. For instance, isolation is a great example. You have an isolation on the hardware, which is a physical isolation. Then you have it on the hypervisor, VM isolation. Then you have it between the processes. Then you have it between the Docker. And then you have it on the application on the user, right? So quite a lot of redundancy for what we're trying to do. And when I look at the kernel and try to understand why it's so complicated, I understand that one of the reasons it's so complicated is because its job is to protect, right? It's protect application for application, user from user, and application from user. And that was a, make a lot of sense on the 5060, right? That was like a business use case. I'm buying this huge mainframe, right? So expensive. I cannot afford myself to run my application on it by myself. I need to share it. And therefore, we need somehow to make sure that we will have to protect the guys that sharing it with me. So my application will not go and delete his memory, for instance, right? And that was make a lot of sense back then. But the question is, is that make sense today? And it's probably not, because that causes a lot of problems. Like, for instance, there is a needless prim uh, permission check, right? You always need to see who is, who is the guy who's running, uh, you know, what is pr his permission, and so on. And that slowed down the actual application. If you're looking at the kernel itself, when I'm running right now on my laptop, you will discover that actually I'm running um, a lot of drivers that doesn't make any sense. For instance, I'm, writing, I'm right now running the floppy driver. No one using floppy anymore. The bit and the byte are still running on my machine. If you're looking at the cloud when I'm running on AWS, you're running US, U, uh, UBS, USB, sorry. Even though you cannot directly go to the machine, you're still running this driver, right? So a lot of unnecessary component running on your machine. And when you're trying to update your machine and you're doing something like a YAM update or get up, you're getting a lot of junk to your machine. Again, you don't know what you really need, what you don't need, and I will tell you that you don't need a lot of this. Still going to run on your storage, right? In terms of security, if you have a lot of stuff that you don't need on your machine, this is a very, very vulnerability, vulnerability point, right? So the, large of, of the, large, the surface of attack is huge, right? Because I can think about where I will do, maybe Telnet, right? Like the last, uh, like the last uh, big uh, DDoS and so on, because there is a lot of vulnerability on this stack. And microservices architecture, we're sharing a lot of stuff. We're sharing kernel and memory and file system and hardware. And the only thing that we're really protecting us here is C group. And this is like putting a lock on a very big house with a lot of windows and doors. It's not really, you know, people are still going to penetrate that, right? Um, if we're looking at the Linux kernel language, there is quite a lot. And that's the language that one needs to know in order to maintain that. So it's going on and on, right? And I will argue that there is not a lot of people in the ecosystem that know all of this and understand and know how to reason about with all this language. Um, in terms of in, in, in size, lines of code, it's just a parameter that I choose. My definition is that a small application is 10K line of code. A medium application is like 100K. And if you're looking at the huge one that a team is maintaining and making sure that it's uh, you know, working, it's one million line of code. This is only the kernel, only the kernel of the operating system that you're running, 22 million lines of code, right? 
If you're looking at the Debian distro, the, the last I, I just, it was 419 million lines of code. This is crazy, right? I mean, you have a lot, a lot of, the, of code there. It's very hard to reason about. So I told you that there is quite a lot of inefficiency of how we're running stuff today. And the question is, how did we get there, right? Well, how come it's so inefficient? And the answer is that it's a pure evolution, right? We started with the mainframe, go all the way to the Android IoT devices. And all this way, what, was put, what basically was walking out with us was um, Linux, or Unix, actually. So what can Linux run on anything? What can run on Linux anything? I can take the last distro today of, uh, I don't know, Debian distro, put it on Pentium 10 years ago, it will work, right? It's just going to work. I will not need to do anything. So we make a decision as a community, and our decision was that it's more important to us to support comp compatibility versus efficiency, right? Um, and it works, right? We're running it, you're running it in your infrastructure, but you know what? Maybe it's time right now to make it right, and then hopefully to make it fast. And that's great, but the question is how? How can we make it better? Can we rewrite the operator system? That's probably a lot of work. What about running one from scratch? Again, probably will be very problemat uh, problematic, or is it? And I, I, I encourage you to think differently. Um, this, this is like uh, Linus, the guy who actually wrote the kernel of the, operating, the, the Linux kernel. And basically what he is, is this is like an argument between micro, micro kernel and monolithic uh, kernel back on the day. And what I want you to take is the last thing that he say, which is basically that he wrote this operating system, this kernel, basically, without any knowledge in a year, which means that it's not that hard. We can do that. And that's exactly what the community of the Unikernel did. They basically rewrote an um, oh, um, operating system. So let, let's, let's understand how it's work, right? So today, when you're running your application, you're running a kernel, you have all the OS libraries, and on top of it, you're putting your application. No matter what you're running, which application you're running, you always have all this stack. What the Unikernel is doing, they say, what if we will, we will look at it differently? We will look at the application, we will see only what this application needs, and we will pick and choose what we need. And that's exactly what they did. So it will look something like that, right? It's only going to take part of the kernel, it's going only to take part of the, li uh, the libraries, and basically package them together. So that, this is more kind of like the technical thing. So what is Unikernel? So in order to make something like this, we needed to make some uh, design choice, right? And our design choice was we're going to run only one single process. Because if you're running one single process and one user, which is what we're doing in, my, in microservices architecture today, then we can be very, very smart about reducing a lot of the complexity. So for instance, so first of all, it's all based on library OS. All the drivers are library OS. It's contain only what it's needs. It's a single process, so if your application is forking, you cannot use it, but it is supporting multi-threads, right? Um, and, and by the way, this is why it makes sense. So like, Unic there's nothing new about Unikernel, that this, uh, this technology has existed for a while, and the reason it's really, really catching up right now, because it makes sense to the microservices architecture, right? Because in the end of the day, you're running one service, one process, it actually makes sense. So single address space, again, because all this multi-address space, usually it's for, for protect, right? I need to make sure that if I'm running my process and you're running your process on the same machine, so I want to really make sure that, if my, that my application will not go to your memory space and you know, mess it up, right? Because then your application will be killed. Um, no virtual memory isolation, no context switching. Again, all those rings that usually you have, you have the kernel mode versus the, the user mode, it's not necessary because everything is going to run on the kernel mode. And the reason is because those, those actually um, uh, rings, it's again for protect, for protect because if I'm running and I want to do something nasty to the machine, and my application is trying to do nasty, I need to make sure that your process is not getting hurt, right? So that's basically the idea. But again, if I'm the only process who's running on the machine, guess what? If I will kill the machine, it will die, then the application will not work. But you know what? So what? That, that, I mean, I need to fix that. But I didn't influence anybody else. I didn't take an hypervisor down, didn't take other, um, you know, OS down, because no one else running in this OS. Um, and the beauty of it, that this is a real Im immutable infrastructure because to Unikernel you cannot SSH, right? Because we don't want to put something that you don't need there and SSH something that is very vulnerable. So we want to make sure that you will not be able to SSH to machine, which means that if you need to upgrade for instance your machine, what you're going to do, you will build a new one and you run it. Real, real Im immutable infrastructure. 
Um, so how do you do that, right? Okay, so you have your application, you're taking your application, you're taking your application config, you're taking your application dependency, you're taking your language runtime and your R drive and driver, basically put all of them in kind of like a magic tool and then creating a unicorn. And Unikernel can run, it's bootable image, so it can run on bare metal, but do we really want to take an application of 56 meg and dedicate a full host bare metal? Probably not. That's why we're going to use an hypervisor, right? Because that just makes sense. Again, the beauty about hypervisor is that it's given a isolation on the a phys physical isolation, right? So if you're looking at that, so, so that's very, very secure. So you're getting the security of VM because it is VM, right? Again, the security of the VM, you're getting all this thing that you can do, vMotion and everything that it's already, you know, you have and, and it's a very, very mature um, technology, but you're getting the fast boot, the performance, the easiness of container. So what did we do? We just removed what we don't need. That's basically it. We just took the stack, said all of this is not necessary, let's remove it. And if you look at the stack, right, the stack looks a little bit different right now, much, much more slim, much more down, right? And if you wanna, if someone will say, hey, we can run it on bare metal, and then anyway, we're making it small. So not exactly, exa again, what is important here is that um, it's the, the physical isolation, and this is key. And hypervisor is the one who knows actually today how to do a physical, uh, basically leveraging the CPU to do a physical uh, hardware isolation, which is very, very important. Um, so again, summarize the unikernel. There is no other user, there's no um, multi-user support. You can put it on your application level, but it's not on the OS level. No permission check, which is great, because now you can actually utilize 100% of your, uh, of your hardware to your application. So performance are very, very strong. Isolation um, in, the, in the virtual hard drive only. We mean that you're sharing all, only hardware. Um, minima, if you're looking at size, minimum operating system today that you will take in instance or whatever, it's probably one gig at least. When we're talking about Unicorn, we're talking about case in size. Basically, your application size is the size of your Unicorn. Um, the, sh sh the, the boot time is very short because there is not a lot to, to boot. Basically, what we did, we kind of like wrapping it with a little bit of memory management and a little bit of scheduling. So it's really, it's like 2,000 line, you know, it's nothing on your application. Um, which it should, um, short boot time, it's very interesting to something like, for instance, serverless or Lambda or function as a service or whatever it's been called, um, because today they are reusing container. With Unikernel, you don't need it. It's fast. It's very, very fast when it's booting, so you can actually dedicate machine from function. Um, the, the surface of attack is very tiny, but it's also custom, which is very, very important, which means that for one application, let's say that I have an application and I somehow manage to penetrate to it, it's not going to work for me on a different Unikernel, right? Because the OS libraries are different. So it's much harder for me to guess what will be there and what not. And as I said before, the most important, it's a, it's a really immutable infrastructure. It's perfect fit for what we're running today. That's why it's starting to be successful. Okay, so I hope there is no question, no question hmm, for now. So there is two types of unikernel today in the ecosystem. One of them is what's called language specific. Uh, you probably all learn about your um, unikernel system that got bought by, uh, acquired by Docker. They're running a unikernel called Mirage OS. Um, it, it's very good unikernel. The only thing with it is that you have to write your code in OCaml because that's the way it works. In OCaml, not a lot of people using this language today. Um, so that's limitation. Include OS is another great um, um, unikernel. It's a C++ unikernel. Again, the problem is that you literally need to write include OS on your, on your code, which means that they rewrote all the libraries OS, which is kind of like interesting. Um, the other op uh, option is to go with something called POSIC compliance. So POSIC is like the, the API of the operating system. And what you can do is basically, if your application it can run on POSIC compliance, it's run on this unikernel. A great example is Rampron. This is probably the best one. OS Suite's kind of unikernel, not really, but it's good for Java. Um, so again, we run on unikernel, Go, a Ruby, Python, whatever, just name it, like C++, Java, just name it, we can run it on unikernel. So this is a performance benchmark, just a, an example. So OS Suite, so it's unikernel that got wrought by a company called Cloudius in Israel. And they were all about Unikernel and about how cool it is until Docker came and then they kind of like freaked out. 
So what did they do? They pivot, right? And their pivot said, we're going to take Cassandra. We rewrite it to run on Unikernel. We will call it ScalaDB, and we will get better performance. And that's exactly what they did. And actually, it's actually 10 times better. So this is like a huge, huge uh, boot in uh, performance. Uh, oh, we went time. OK, so this is an example for two cool projects in Unikernel. One of them is, um, is uh, the guys from Orange OS. They basically wanted to show you how secure it is. So what did they do? They created a Unikernel. They call it Pinata. They put some Bing code inside. And they said to you, go ahead, try to attack it. And this is there, I think, for over two years. No one managed to actually penetrate to it. They managed to take it down, and then it went up again and get smarter. So in the end of the day, it's very, very secure. In terms of secure, it's, 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 it's you. So I mean, you can go. I mean, I think it will work if I will go here. Basically, you can go and look at it and try to take it down. So that's that. The other unikernel, it's, uh, it's Erling. Um, I think what's cool about it is what they put in here, a statistic, to show how quick it's actually booting. So 300 seconds is how much you're taking, you're taking an instance up in the Amazon uh, EC2. 50 uh, seconds is how much you power the lock screen from your Android. And 0.2 seconds ago, I clicked this button. And the, the, the unicorn is already up and running, right? So just give you an example of how quick uh, you, can, you, can, you can actually spin up a unicorn. OK. So what did we do? OK, so I looked at it and I said, wow, this is really great, right? This is, sounds like this is the right architecture for the cloud. And of course, Internet of Things, because in Internet of Things, there is three power methods that are very interesting. The tuning kernel is a is, is very good one. One of them, it's very slim. When you're taking stuff, stuff with you, actually, the thing with you, you want it to be small. So you, cannot, you, don't, you don't have an endless storage. Therefore, it's really good if, if the application is not taking this storage. For, you know, but the system is not taking the storage. Um, the second thing, it's very good in performance. And the last thing, it's very secure. All these three things make it very, very good for Internet of Things. So again, the question is, what do we do? When we look at it, we understand that uh, that was very, very, you know, that's exactly the same scenario that container was before Docker make it easy to use. It's just very hard, right? You need to compile hyper uh, drivers. You need to make all the mess that I just described. It's very, very hard. So what we wanted to do is make it easy for you to do it. So we will do all the hard work for you. And that's exactly what Unique is, is about. So it's a Go, it's reading it Go, it's open source project. I will give you the link very soon. And it's very simple. So how does it work? You're, taking, you're basically doing unique build. You're building an image, like Docker. So you're giving the application, um, a, the code of the application, like as you see here, example app, for instance, the folder. You tell me which unikernel type you want. So for instance, maybe you want to run it on the Mirage OS. Maybe you want to run it in Run Run. Make choice. This is your choice. And then uh, which language your application is reading in. So as I said, you will go to our website, our, basic, our GitHub, but basically we're supporting every, almost everything that it's out there except of Ruby and not for good reason, just because we, just, I don't know, we didn't do that. And then in terms of provider, which provider? Where do you want to run it? So do you want to run it on AWS? Do you want to run it locally on your virtual machine? Do you want to run it on Google? Just tell us where. We will do that for you. And then the last one, give me a name of the image. So now we're building it. We're making the magic. And in the end of the day, you're getting some image. And now what you can do is just you know, run. So run your image. So it's that simple. This is, for my opinion, the most important slide in my talk because I think that what's special about Unique is the way we actually build it. And surprise, surprise, we were very inspired by the Kubernetes architecture because we feel that this is the best, which is very, very kind of like um, not tied together, right? Um, everything is an is a, is a interface, and that's exactly what, uh, what that this is our main interface in Unique. So one of them is the Unique kernel type. We don't know which one is the best. We have our guests, we have our favorite, but, but this is a very, very new community, so we don't know, you know who will pick up. Therefore, we didn't want to ch make a choice. So for instance, we're supporting out of the box Include OS. Include OS is actually, um, a, it's actually a pull request from Include OS itself. So very, very simple to edit. It's basically creating a Docker container. Everything is very, very easy. Um, Mirage OS, Ramp Run, and OSV. In terms of, uh, of cloud provider, so we didn't want to choose that as well, right? I don't know where you want to run. So right now, out of the box, we were running on a OpenStack. That's a pull request from a project in EU, actually, that's using it. Uh, VirtualBox, if you want it, local, AWS, it's Photon, it's EMC, it's not EMC, it's VMware, new, 
VC that's supposed to scale. Uh, vCenter, QMU mainly for debugging. So we are debugging Unikernel. That's how we're building what we're building. And right now we automate only the QMU, only the QMU debugger, but actually we can do it for anything. So it's not true that you cannot debug Unikernel. We're doing it all the time. And KVM again, if you want to run. But the beauty of it is that today I will announce that we're also supporting Google Cloud. So this is new. We just basically push it, help us make it better. But the idea is that uh, we're supporting a Google Cloud as well. And, and the last thing is basically the architecture, a uh, process architecture. As Anna said, um, Intel was no brainer, but because we really want to focus on Internet of Things, it was make sense for us to um, support ARM devices for embedded device. Um, and also, we did what Docker did, which is basically a unique hub. And why? Because it's a little bit different, the Docker hub. Because there is no um, um, layers on the file system, right? It's basically image. So this is an example, you know, so it's very simple. It's pull, push, open source. You can go play with it, um, contribute to it, which is even better. And what you see here is that I'm pulling a Minecraft and running it on Unikernel. So that's what this slide is about. Um, and, okay, so the, the, the other thing that we did is we basically wanted to, uh, we understand that the, everybody really, really liked the Docker API. Really, really feel comfortable with that. And they have already scripted that running with, with the Docker API. So we didn't want you to need to learn new API. And therefore what we did, we basically um, create, um, we teach Unique how to speak Docker API. That's simple. Now, there is of course limitation because the reason we created the, the Unique API is because Unique is a little bit different, right? Unique, Unique only need to know where it's running on. It's not infrastructure independent. Docker is, right? You just need to run it on, on OS. So you, the, the minor saga for it is that you will not be able to build with the Docker API because, as I said, it just doesn't make any sense. But you will be able to run and PS and so on, and that's what you see here in the slide. Um, and today, we're also going to announce that we support Kubernetes. So, Unicorn are very great, and Unique is very great to make those Unicorn, but it's like Docker making a container. It's not going to make sure that it will stay alive. It's not going to make sure that the, you know, the health, the monitor, all of this is not something that the Unicorn, you know, Unique is going to do for you. Um, so that's, what Kubernetes, that's why we decided to leverage Kubernetes. So basically the idea with this is right before you could run Rocket or Docker container in a pod, now you can run Unicorn in a pod. So I will show a demo real quick soon. So what did we do there? Because it's kind of like interesting, right? Unicorn is basically a VM, so how does it work? So the way it works is basically, um, I'll try to show it. It's basically the idea is that it's still talking to the kubelet, but the kubelet is talking to Unique and making us to run the, v the, the VM. So that means you can actually run a container side by side next to Unikernel in your kubecon, in your, in your, in your Kubernetes. And the beauty of it is that, think about it, when you're running on Kubelet, you still need the node. So if, for instance, you overlocated, you need to put more nodes. In Unicorn, you're not, right? When your application is running, you're creating Unicorn. When your application is running, you're creating Kubernetes. So, so basically, there is no node notion here. So I will show you again a demo now, actually. Any questions, by the way? What, 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 sorry? Which version? Uh, we took the last one. Just. Uh, but it's open source. Like, go look what we did. I can show you if you want. Uh, okay, so what we're going to do. So we're going to open a command line. So first, let me show you what you think. Is that big enough? Can you see it? Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm SSH to a machine that's running unique. And what we're going to do is unique PS, and you'll discover that there is no unique kernel running. We can do unique images. That's the one that I built before. So let's just go and run something. Um, unique run. And like, it's just a node. As you see, it's just I put instance name will be edit because it's my name and Node.js application just for echo of it. So I'm clicking it and then it's up. So this is specifically running on AWS. If I will do yes again, I will see that I'm getting an IP address. And I can just go and run. I will show you this website. And what you will discover is that this website is 56 meg. OK? So in a second, it will be up. And this is 56 meg of a website. That's the Node.js one? Yes, yes. Why, why are the other ones that you have? It's bigger because it's OS3. Potentially bigger. 
Yeah, because it's OSV. So we're working right now. Oh, OSV, the other, as I said, it's kind of unique, it's kind of like Ecker. The way we build it, and we're going to change it, actually we have already pull requests for that, mm -hmm. is that we kind of like not guessing the size, we just said we're going to take this size, and we're going to build this. This is the way OSV worked. So this is not really working, so it's always going to be that big, but we already have a pull request for it, so it's going to be dramatically shrink. Um, so this is the website, right? It's running on AWS. Now the beauty of it, and I want you to understand, it's actually running on the zen of the AWS. We didn't put any layer, there's no hypervisor between, it's all like the actual instance is running Unikernel on the zen, okay? And as you see, this is a website, 56 meg. Again, I'm not sure that there is a lot of website in that small running there. Now, what we can do, we can actually go and, uh, I don't know, this is a demo that usually I'm doing, we can run another unique, now, unique also support logs, so if you're doing unique logs, you can get all the logs um, of all the stack, which is kind of cool, right? Um, so now let's just do unique run, and I will run a Minecraft server. Just You will see. So I'm just running a Minecraft application. That's the big one, unfortunately. Um, let's take the IP address of it. And as you can see, I can just come here. I have before Minecraft server. I'm going to add the server. Just going to add the server. And I need to write the IP address. A sec. The IP address is 44. 54208 and 75 80, 80. And Hopefully, in a second, huh? what happened? Did I put the right address? Did I miss up the address or something? Probably missed up the address. So, we'll show you that in a minute because I probably wrote the. Is it still on the pending state or is it not? Yeah, no, but that should be fine. I think it's just because. Oh, now it's good. I don't know what happened. Okay, so right now, this is Unikernel running Minecraft, right? Now, the beauty of it is that right now, I can go to this address, just any browser, and when I'm taking it, I can do 9967 port slash logs, and you will see all the logs of the Unikernel. So, I don't know if you can see it, if it's too big, but it's like I run it, so it's basically the, the Unikernel started running the operating system, I joined the game, zombie ate me, and so on. So basically, I'm getting all the logs, which is kind of cool, right? So that's that, let's remove it. So now the next thing that we're going to do is we show you the Kubernetes. So, okay, so I'm going to SSH to a new machine that I have. And what we're going to do here is unique PS to see that nothing is running. And as you see, nothing is running. So now what I'm going to do is go CLA, run. So basically, I'm just running unique kernel. You can see this. So I run three of them, OK? So if we will go right now, for instance, to the Kubernetes dashboard, and we refresh it, and we'll see that I have three instances of pods running. Now what I can do is do this. So we'll come here and I will watch Unique PS. So as you see, I have the three of them, right? Uh, we can go look at the application one second that you will not see that it's actually running. Uh, let's just take one of them. Let's open a browser. So I'm doing this and this is a Go application of the Asteroid game. <coughs> One second. The network here is not something. Okay. I don't know why it's taking. What's going on today with the network? Okay. So this is the Go Asteroid game. If you know it, I can click on it and stop playing. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. So the thing right now, what I'm going to do, as you see, I have two instances of it running on Kubernetes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to destroy one of them from Unique. So I'm doing Unique Delete Instance. 
minus minus instance. And I'm going to choose one of them, doesn't really matter which. And then I will do force because it's running. And what you will see right now is I will delete it here and you see how group is adding it, right? Not that uh, magic. So I delete it here. If we will go here, you will see now we have only two and in a second tack it's returning it, right? Five minutes, okay? So that's basically the Kubernetes we have, we live. Um, okay, so I will go one, because he, he signed it, I have five minutes. So I will go real quick to the presentation because I want you to see a little bit more stuff. So first of all, this is very interesting to me. Um, we, did, we understood that Unikernel is perfect fit for Internet of Things. We wanted to make it, instead of talking about it, actually make it done. So what you see here, it's uh, our laptop. We're basically putting a Unikernel on top of Raspberry Pi, and guess what? Black screen. We cannot see anything. Okay, we can't even debug it, right? So what we did, we connected uh, another uh, uh, Raspberry Pi with a GDB and start to debug it. And basically, usually in a conference, and you can go online and see what I'm doing is this demo. Basically, you're making a unikernel, unique running me a toaster on stage and you know, making me a toaster on stage. But I don't have time to, to do that, so go look in the internet. But that's very interesting. So everybody probably heard about the last DDoS attack uh, that took the internet down. We wrote a great blog on it and why it will not be happen if it was running unikernel instead. So I really, really, you know, oops. I really, really uh, encourage you to go and look at this because I feel, uh, and this is on the Wiki website, so a uh, GitHub, so you can just go there. Okay, so that's one thing. The second thing is that when we look at that uh, announcement from Microsoft, we said, oh, shit, that's interesting, right? Microsoft did a good, very, very good, huge favor for us. They basically make uh, .NET running on NetBSD. Now, RAM Prime, which is my favorite Unicorn, basically what it is is that it's NetBSD. They did a rewrite to the, the, uni, to the, to the operating system, and they basically componented it. So now if you have component, you can pick and choose what you need, right? So basically, they're using the drivers of NetBSD. If they're using the driver of NetBSD, it means that it shouldn't be so hard for me to run .NET on a, on a Unicorn. And that's exactly what we're working on it right now. So the idea is that think about it. No license to Microsoft whatsoever. You're not running on the server. You're getting a very, very quick DevOps experience, and you're running .NET application. So I think this is really cool. The other thing is that we talked about it a little bit, serverless, right? So you probably all know, but serverless, uh, Lambda, and all of this, they're using, reusing container because it's hard. You know, it's taking time to boot them. You don't need to do that with Unicorn. So we're working right now. We probably will open source very soon. Um, basically a serverless implementation with a backend of a unikernel. So you will make a choice. You can still run container if you like, but you can also run that and that make it actually easier, right? Because there's no using and so on. It's open source. It's actually, we open sourced it, I wanna say five months ago, four months ago. And this is my repository, my team repository. If you will go, you will see that we are actually on thousand stars. There is people coming all the time. It's getting a lot of attention. And there is a community, so please, please come help us make it better. Um, so what we did, so what I did, I'm the marketing person apparently also. So I did a, um, a Slack channel. We, have, we are always there. We are helping questions. You know, your answer will be always answered. I opened a Twitter account for Unique. There is people there. It's actually probably more than double than what you see here in the number. And as I said, again, the GitHub, we're answering any issues. And this is my team. This is all the people who did the, the real job here. It's like me, I'm the CTO, and I have two engineers that are working with me. And we did all of this with pull requests. But as I said, it will be very, very useful for us if you will help us because we cannot do it by ourselves. Um, that's what I have, if you have a question. Hey. Yeah, so a question I have is actually not having the repo live under EMC Advance and having it live under CNCF. Is that something that you'd consider? Because I think that would be a great way to actually get Yeah, so I mean, Look, we we two people running on it. Yeah, we will love that because we need a community to help. I know that the Cloud Foundry asked us to put it under their repository. Get it under CNCF. I mean, have you, if you know there's someone, we will give it. I mean, look, to be end, to be fair, I mean, I have my, my day job. I'm a CTO, and besides that, I'm doing this, and I have she my. Would be against it I totally take it. It's yours. It's the community. We we have nothing to do with it. Um, Yeah, well, what I was running, I, I can't, I can't hear you. So you actually run the Unicorn as a Yes, yes. 
And, and I wanted to show, so, so in AWS, when we're actually building the Unicorn, we're we creating an AMI and then spin it up. Now, just you will know, it doesn't really make sense to run on AWS. I want you to know that. And the reason is because I'm running 50, sec 50 meg uh, image, but I'm actually paying for one gig. Doesn't make sense whatsoever. So that's not the, the cloud that I will choose. Google Cloud hopefully can help us better. I mean, to be fair, we thought that the reason we wanted to support Google Cloud is exactly because of that, because they have this flavor that you can make the size that you want. But you will discover that the minimum size is still big. <laughs> so if, if, if they, I mean, but I believe that if we will make it very, very useful and everybody will want to run it, I'm really, really guessing that they will change the whole price, pricing, right? Yeah. When you say Google Cloud GCE, right? Yes. What about GKE? We didn't I mean, know that yet. We can. Right now we support, I mean, I don't know if I show you, but um, it's actually open source. We open source. I, mean, I would assume if, if you're running on Kubernetes, then GKE would be a slam dunk, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, we, we, we didn't do pull request yet. We did the changes that we needed in Kubelet and so on. I mean, we, it's there. It's open source, as you see. No one is, because it's an awesome. Go help, it, help us. But the beauty of it is what we did, we basically added two supports so you, for Unique. But because we wanted to run the actually dashboard and so on, so what we did, we also running Unique, and that's running uh, Docker. So what we did, we basically did a MOOCs, which is basically both of them. So you can run Unique and container side by side, which I think Kyle, yeah, they want me to finish. Yeah. One, oh. last? Yeah. Okay, you want to take it offline? Okay, we'll take it offline. Thanks. <laughs>